I'm in the business of wanting to resurrect that triumphant beast in me. Welcome to The Boundless Body, the podcast with the somatic doctor interviewing innovative thinkers about their perspectives relating to the arts and sciences of therapy. Discover The Boundless Body. Back to the mystery. You just reminded me, I know, of course, I'm going to forget who said this, but they talk about that with somebody's experiencing, you know, post-traumatic symptoms, post-traumatic stress symptoms. Your body is the battlefield. Like, you are not escaping what's like, and it is constant. And so, yeah, exactly what you're saying. The body is not a safe place to be, and there is no escaping them. So no wonder people dissociate or create healing fantasies, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why it's so important. And you, you know, this as an adolescent and child psychiatrist, that imagination is a tremendous resource. And, and you know, instead of going into the body and going into the con concrete, what happened? No, let's go to the realm of the imagination. So, you know, that we can find the dissociated self, the fragmented self, because it's hanging out there, you know, it found a safe place. And so I use the imagination a lot clinically, right? Because the imagination, symbolism, dream symbology, because it's a, I call it the halfway house between the other world and the body. Yeah. And the imagination is kind of the halfway house for that. And we need to meet people in that space. Yeah. You know, you're actually reminding me that I mean, the very first journey I had, the first thing she, you know, and ayahuasca is referred to as she did was to show me some of my trauma, but as a witness, like I was, you know, hovering above and gave also gave me kind of an ob kind of a ob objective perspective. Like, yeah, that kind of sucked, but like, unfortunately, like your experience is kind of, it happens. It happens to people, right? Get Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you're saying, like kind of getting outside and being able to have some perspective and not be with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so, so there's attached this, to it, right? Like yeah. so attached to our suffering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from a developmental perspective, it's like you have this developmental arrest because... Yes. There's been a neglect or there's been an abuse. And, and I think psychedelics can have a way of getting things moving, you know, just getting things moving, getting the, the serotonin fluctuating on a molecular level, you know, and the other neuromodulators, because it's not just serotonin, right? But just to get, often the image is used of a snow globe, you know what I mean? Just like, hey, let's get the molecules going because there's the, there, there's some, Freud called it a cathexis, which actually isn't a bad term. It's really just like a kind of knotting, you know, like in the, in the, in, in the neural apparatus and in the brain and stuff like that, where yeah. you have a, some sort of a rest or a blockage is something stuck in there, you know? And I yeah. think that's an interesting way to frame it, right? Is the snow globe effect. Yeah. And what we know that psychedelics do in a profound, amazing way is they afford neuroplasticity, right? And in, in multiple ways, right? Allowing for, you know, neuroplasticity is just as far as allowing for, no, you know, new brain cell formation, right? Uh, neuroplasticity yeah. as far as allowing us to kind of shift our perspective, just even ever so slightly on something. And I know I'm talking a lot about psychedelics, but I don't want to neglect what what really makes really them effective is the integ integration work integration. you do afterwards, right? So yeah. the therapy yeah. you get after you've had this that allows you to harness this neuroplasticity to be able to try new things, figure out new things, see things a little differently, change your beliefs or perspective because trauma collapses our perspective. It makes us very myoptic. And because it's trying to be very, you know, your, your, your mind, body, everything's trying to be very rigid to keep you safe, like black or white. That's it. Like this is just safe. This is not safe. The psychedelics bring us back to this critical period, which is already, which is the period of adolescence, right? When you're trying new things, trying new personas, trying different beliefs on. 
it so brings it us back to brings, that period yeah. and opens Very things true. up for us. Mm -hmm. Which is why actually, I'm, I'm part of a group that's looking to develop protocols with ketamine around it for use in adolescence. Some of the things that some of the group consensus is that adolescents may not need as much as we think, right? Sometimes even once a week treatment is okay for ketamine and maybe even just a couple sessions because they're already there. They're already in this critical period. We're kind of catching them at an ideal time, actually. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, the literature is pretty darn clear about ketamine in terms of amping up the BDNF system. Yeah. Right. Brain derived neurotrophic yeah. factor, which is a growth, which is a neuro, it's fundamental to neuroplasticity. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's fundamental to neuroplasticity. So that the research is, is really clear about that. Yeah. And it, it, what about the other? Sub psychedelic substances out there. Has, have you seen a linkage to this BDNF stuff and the kind of neurotrophic system, the growth neuroplastic system? I don't believe it's as strong as with some of the ketamine, but it is it is occurring. I think they all work a little differently, right? Like so MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy, tends to be what we call like the empathogen. So really, so when we have relational trauma. So actually, there's studies being done on using it in couples, and I actually know practitioners are using it in couples. And actually, just this week, I met a therapist. It absolutely saved her marriage, like doing an MDMA session. I mean, they were separated. It pretty much looked like it was going nowhere. And they did this, and it was really allowed them to talk in a way that was very open and, you know, without being so defended. Psilocybin shows some interesting things in what it does to valence or your fear system, right? Kind of downregulating that a bit because as we know with trauma if fear is, your fight or flight is on is almost all the time and so i think they all work in different ways to create this type of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. welcome to the boundless body podcast where we ask the simple and powerful question what can a body do I'm Dr. Brian Tierney. I'm a somatic psychologist, a neuroscience professor, and a specialist in trauma resolution. The Boundless Body Podcast is brought to you by BiTap, the creators of a powerful bilateral stimulation tool for nervous system regulation. I use this tapping technology clinically because it's a wonderful, gentle, pulsatile, tactile stimulation that helps the brain to regulate experience. And what I mean by regulate experience is not just managing the bad stuff, but amplifying the good stuff. So these tappers aren't just used clinically, they're used in many different settings, including with frontline workers, people that have test anxiety, kids and parents, teachers and school counselors, people in addiction recovery, restless sleepers, and people that are struggling with pain management and medical issues. So the benefits are vast. You can go to the BiTap website to get your tappers to help with your nervous system. And you can enter the Brian 10 code to get your discount. I hope you enjoy the show. Yeah. So ketamine is interesting because it works very directly with the glutamate system. Yes. Now, when I, when I'm teaching the, the brain stuff, brain metabolism, I talk about how Basically, the fundamental piston for brain metabolism is glutamate GABA, glutamate GABA. Or I should go GABA glutamate because gl glutamate's an upper. It's, it's stimulating. Yeah. It drives memory production. Yeah. And GABA is kind of like the chill out inhibitory. It's mostly inhibitory, but these are the workhorses. Yeah. Yeah. These are the workhorses and they're underappreciated workhorses in the literature, but glutamate is fund fundamental to memory production. And isn't it interesting that the glutamate system is directly uh, interfaced with via ketamine. So yeah. we're, we're tinkering with memories already, right? When we're, when you take ketamine into the body and can you talk a little bit about maybe long-term potentiation, which is memory production, a la glutamate and how ketamine gets into that system and what it might be doing there. So I can talk about it from a clinical sense, right? And I, what I see is clients having memories of things 
that may not have been as accessible prior to that. Mm -hmm. And then questions that come out about that or the linking of memories, right, with kind of what's going on for them, why they may. Recently, I was, when I recently done another journey with ayahuasca, it's about shame. And it really brought up some very distinct events and memories like tied to it. And so I, th- I believe that's how it's working. Kind of, it's giving you some meaning making, but also can, you know, for some people, the hard thing is that we know, and Bessel van der Kolk talks about this, right? Right. This is a problem with when you have people, you know, in courtroom situations, right? And you're asking them to give vivid, distinct details. That's not what happens when trauma. Unfortunately, a lot of the memories, you know, get, get stored in, in a very fragmented way. And so opening up these mm-hmm. memory circuits really allows us to kind of put the pieces together with the idea that gives you a better picture of what occurred. But again, the ability to process what, what's actually happened and kind of the full spectrum mm-hmm. of it. It's going to be very mm-hmm. beneficial, again, to metabolize and process and witness, right? To re-experience what happened, which sounds awful. But only once we kind of really experience it, be validated, witnessed, and then process it, can we get to the other side. Otherwise, it stays stuck in that post-traumatic cycle, right? just looping. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what trauma does. It keeps us not yeah. only developmentally. We talk about development and keeping you stuck in time, but it, it really, it keeps the memories stuck. It, your body wants to protect you and be like, don't you ever forget what happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's essential, you know, and then psychodynamics and in therapy, we often meet with this term regression yeah. and regression is going back in time to something bad that happened so that you can, from this neural perspective, you can light up those networks, those fragmented networks and do the work of integration. And yeah. in memory terminology, that's called memory reconsolidation work. Yeah. So you got to light up that those networks. You got to access them, and if they if they're not accessed, there's there's no deal in terms of resolving the trauma, right? So it's, yeah. it's essentially memory reconsolidation work in in many yes. ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, you said it much more eloquently than the uh, long winded version, <laughs> but that's exactly. Um, and remember too. So, Part of the trauma work is something that would have shocked your system as a four-year-old and you didn't have the emotional, possibly physical capacity to deal with it. It's giving you the gift as a, you know, for me, a 47-year-old woman to be able to use my tools now to deal with it and process it. There's no way with certain things that happened that any of us could have done it. And so, again, this is what I talk about. It's uncomfortable. But on the other side is healing. Mm-hmm. So the memory superhighway in the brain is known as the default mode network. Okay. Which is our best contender in neuroscience now for the ego. So the default mode network has been shown to uh, exhibit interesting activity under psychedelics. I do think one of the things that's happening because the default mode network, when it's overactive, the person is worrying, perseverating, thinking too much about the self, telling the same stories over and over again, whether they're fragmented or or coherent, and it's just looping. Yes. It's just looping and looping and looping and looping, you know, and, and so there's some good evidence in the, in the literature that something about the ego is being changed. If we're talking about the default mode network being a, a neuroscientific coral correlate to the, uh, to the default mode network. Yeah. And I also yeah. want to give the I default network give... some press time as far as, uh, you know, ADHD. ADHD. So mm-hmm. What it is actually thought is that the toggle switch be- between our task performance network is broken. So when people have, oh, uh, you know, uh, ADHD traits or whatever you want to call it, 
they tend to hang out a lot they more, especially when they're out. supposed to task they're perform to... in the default mode network. So yeah, what we know yeah. too is like yeah. a, a like wandering a, mind is actually an unhappy mind. And so what mm -hmm. a lot of, as I think what you're alluding to and building up to is that psychedelics tend to turn this off. Is it, they, they do tend to turn the default mode network off. And so to help you, because I mean, one of the ways we cope, yes, dissociation is the most obvious way, but Dr. Gibramante talks about it in his book, Scattered. And I would tell you, I see it. I mean, they say ADHD is present in about 25% of people with PTSD. I tell you, it's 100%. I've literally not met one person who has a trauma disorder that does not also meet criteria um, for ADHD, especially the trauma occurred when they were younger. I mean, it seems to be a very adaptive way to be checked out, right? And it's yeah. not advantageous to actually focus on one thing. Your body is hypervigilant, wants to be scanning, wants to know whatever about everything that's going on. Yes, yeah, so I think there's there's different things, like you're talking about the ego, but like all the same thing. It's like where we kind of hang out when we're trying to like, be with and what we need to. Yeah, and the opposite issue can happen with the de default mode network as well, where it's within network connections are very low and everything's all fragmented and, and all over the place. And those aren't the people that we want to be sending to an ayahuasca ceremony, right? You know, because it's right, because it's already just going bonkers. You know, they need there needs to be a kind of consolidation of the cell, you know, uh, as opposed to okay, there. I mean, some people are already blasted, so you know, uh, do we want to blast them further? Yeah, no, I think, yeah. and I think this is where, like, I think I caution people with psychedelics being this panacea. I do think there's a time and a place for it because even post ceremony, the things that you're left with can be very challenging and you have to be in a time and space place to be able to deal with it and have the right providers really work you through it. So I, I can't, I feel that the, the biggest work happens after your, your ceremony or after the use, like what are you going to do with the messages you got? What are you going to do with this, you know, neuroplasticity that you have now? But yeah, it's, there's some people that's just not appropriate. And, but I, I hate to say this too. I mean, I had a vet, I, you know, I'm part of this, a nonprofit group called Care Possible. And we had a vet who, for all practical pers purposes, was completely, sh for, you know, to use the lingo we're using, like, just shattered and fragmented. And we actually thought we were going to, just, like, I thought I was going to lose him. We sent him to get I began treatment yeah. and it was like it was life saving. I mean, he's still there's still things he's struggling with. He's I really thought the Saturday before I was I was just like praying. I'm like, I I just need you to make it to this thing. Like just I mean I wasn't telling him that I was telling myself I just need him to make it. So it can work sometimes when people are it can work. They just need to have the right support around that and especially the right integration yeah because those those neurons are going to get stimulated for a new experience they're going to be labile they're going to be open that's yeah. the that's the key to all this right everything gets lit up and the neurons kind of open up like little flowers or something yes. like that and they're ready to mm -hmm. be imprinted by a new experience that new experience gets reconsolidated into memory and so it, like you said, I think it's just crucial, the integration process, because it's, we're ready for re-imprinting now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's the problem I have with some, of, like I see all these ketamine clinics popping up really with very, there's very few, very few people really emphasizing the importance of this. It, it's not just the medicine of ketamine, it's what you're doing once you've received it to help make these changes. And I think the other thing you have to be careful of is that people really need to have the right support when they get home because you have this enormous expansion in your neural network of self. And if you're not careful and you throw people back into not so safe situations, you can actually have more trauma 
and severe than contraction of the cell. And that's also yeah. dangerous and not really so ethical. So people it's a really reconfirmation. Have... It's a reconfirmation of the old memory networks that we're hoping to change. Yes. And so it's, you know, a default mode network is deeply social. In fact, it has huge systems overlap with the mirror neuron system. And this is why the default mode network is implicated in autism, because there is so much overlap with the so-called mentalization system, with the theory of mind networks of the brain, there's huge overlap. So, you know, maybe you could just put in a little pitch for, you know, like, hey, is seriously, is LSD being used for folks on the spectrum now? There's a, there's a recent study that recent came out where they used mice models. There was like a, you know, a gene knockout model. <clears throat> So the, the mice models that are kind of be, supposed to be a replica for replica. autism spectrum. And what they found is that they really were much more kind of pro-social once they received the LSD. I think before we were talking about, there's this amazing group of uh, young adults. Um, one of them has written a book called Autism on Acid. And they have a series of, he actually teaches and talks about how psychedelics have been helpful. UCLA was researching MDMA, right, a classic and pathogen for autism to see what type of changes. And I hesitate to say that I hate pathologizing the autism, but what I also see in my clients is a lot of them do suffer because they desperately want to connect with people but don't necessarily have the right tools to do so. So this can be another tool that kind of helps them maybe more naturally connect with people and not in a way that really has to be so hard or difficult or taught. Now, this is an ambitious component of the conversation that we touched on before we clicked record, Ayla. And this is the connection between what's called primary synesthesia, which is a jumbling of the sensory modalities, you know, smell and sight and linguistics and stuff like that. The theory is, is that, you know, as infants and even before we acquired language, uh, you know, over 2 million years ago as great apes, there's this theory that, you know, before this, the sensory modalities were differentiated, everything was just kind of jumbled together in many ways. And that LSD and other psychedelic substances can bring us into contact with the kind of mixing and melding of the different sensory modalities. And that autism and even people with the savant capacities, genius capacities, do seem to exhibit some of this cross-modal mixing, which is also consistent with a lot of trip reports in psychedelics as well. So it's an ambitious kind of weaving here of all of these, but what do you, how could you take that uh, baton that I'm now passing to you and kind of, you know, take it in the direction of what are the implications for this theory and autism treatment and, and working with developmental trauma? Well, I hope I can answer that. But what I will tell you is clinically what I see with people um, on the spectrum is a sensory, I'm just going to call it sensory issue. So I'd have to tell you, even in the young adults, I feel like a hundred percent have some sort of sensory processing disorder. And that has all sorts of flavors to it, right? Like it can actually be, you know, a lot of times what we see is like, oh, they're not really responsive. They kind of are like not really engaged. With sensory processing services, we call that there's under registration. So the sensory system is not registering or it needs a very high threshold to register sensory information. And on the other hand, you can have actually over registration where every little thing seems like it's too much. And so I see that with people. I see a fundamental difficulty with integrating sensory steps 
high percentage of them have issues around reading. I was in a small group with Dr. Peter Mundy, who's a psychologist at the Mind Institute, UC Davis, and he did a lot of seminal research on actually joint attention being what's lacking. So, I mean, it's huge findings in the autism field. Anyways, what he was talking, he said he had to do his entire research career over again. He would do it on auditory processing disorders. So he believes that that's the missing link with autism, that the information that's coming to an auditory system. So auditory processing doesn't mean you can't hear. Auditory processing means the way the information is coming in and is processed can be challenging. And there's multiple things in central auditory processing disorders. So again, I see autism as something went a little awry in in the ability to integrate our sensory systems on multiple levels. I see people with, you know, visual processing disorders. So a lot of times what we kind of think is dyslexia, people actually, their eyes aren't working together. So I see it actually as a multimodality thing that we're just kind of putting under this. Again, if somebody like Dr. Peter Mundy can say, he would redo his whole research career and focus it on. I think, and so I think psychedelics are part of one of my clients. Absolute genius have no idea what his IQ would be. And I think that's a special neurodivergence in itself because we're calling these people, I mean, I think classically you may call him autistic, but I, you know, we've had long discussions. I'm like, well, who would your peers have been? If you were in this smart, I have another really close childhood friend who, I mean, they did studies on her. Her IQ is just so off the charts. Who were her peers that she was practicing her social development with? Like, who are they? I don't know. Nobody. There's nobody in his field or her field. But what was interesting, you know, for him or what my friend has reported is that the psychedelics, the psychic, so for him, he talks about, I really want to connect with people now. He's actually noticed some of, I don't know, he has a history of tics. Those have secret. So like, again, his nervous system is kind of coming together and perhaps really integrating together in a way that wasn't possible. Some things he talks about is he has to work out three hours a day. As far as I'm concerned, that's probably some sort of sensory kind of issue, right? Like the need to kind of really process that and explain or to be down-regulated enough. Uh, so that was a very roundabout way, but I really see autism through that lens, that this is what we're dealing with. And so they really actively have to physically pull from different areas of their brain to put it all together. Whereas I think the psychedelics are bringing a lot more fluidity to that. You see some of the scans with psilocybin, that's definitely what it's showing, right? It's showing that the connectivity is just exploding, the ability to talk to different parts of the brain. So I feel like I'm, I'm hopeful in our lifetime we will look at autism as very different. First of all, these people are enormously gifted and have something uh, important mm. to share, but that what's also, they, they're teaching us a lot about our sensory system, which I think is really under, grossly undervalued. Mm-hmm. Well and said. Similarly, well yeah. done on that. that <laughs> it's it's so awesome. awesome. I know I didn't I like address it. the trauma, but what's fascinating is I met with no, one of these de- yeah. de- developmental de- um, optometrists, kind of like out there. And some of the vision therapy work he does in order to get kind of eyes to conjugate and eyes to work together and the visual processing system going, it would stop coming to treatment because their trauma is being reactivated. So, I mean, this is where we're coming back to the, you know, Shipibo shamanic thing that trauma blocks our senses, the external world, the internal world, you know, our thoughts, our emotions, our fancy. And so it's interesting. So he said he would be doing treatment. It's probably why EMDR can be effective for some people, right? Like we're, we're really reprocessing things. So I think all these sensory pieces are put together and are, are all affected. And one of the main ways that they're put together is, is in the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum is a key region for trauma resolution 
The most effective trauma resolutions light up the cerebellum like a Christmas tree or maybe some non-Christian image of whatever lighting up is, you know, and so re resequencing, re reconsolidation work is fundamentally about the cerebellum because it puts it all together. You know, cerebellum is deeply, deeply implicated in, in autism spectrum disorders and in all developmental disorders. We can say that, you know, what was getting corrected in your daughter when she had early intervention? Cerebellar sequencing. Oh. Cerebellar to, sequencing. I'd have to tell you. So I had, I had use. the best sensory, yes, o- sensory OT. Like she was phenomenal. Yeah. And at this, yeah. the group she was going also had OT. Anytime we stopped Anytime the we stopped individual OT stuff, and it was for various stuff, reasons. It was for various reasons. It, her speech progression speech halted. So my youngest was in the less than first percentile for expressive and receptive speech. Every time there was a renewed interest in doing the sensory OT work, oh my God, her speech would explode. And that's when I really started checking in. And, you know, 70% of people on the spectrum will also qualify for an ADHD diagnosis to the point where in the old DSM-4, we weren't supposed, we really technically couldn't give a different diagnosis. So again, you're talking again about the default mode network. What we know with individuals, um, and this research was uh, done by the uh, authors who wrote Driven to Distraction, it was like the groundbreaking book, right, about ADHD, uh, two Harvard psychiatrists with ADHD. So Dr. Rowdy, one of my, uh, one of the teachers in the program I did, the mutation, the cerebellum is the vermis. So, right, the worm, thin structure in between the two hemispheres is smaller in individuals with ADHD. And that's where, you know, positioning, posture, balance. So I asked him, I was, what did you do, you know, in your treatment? Because basically the, the research study he did was a lot of OT-like balancing type things. He was like, don't worry about it. He's like, get him to do sports, get him to do anything. He was like, like, get get that cerebellum going and moving. So yeah, I am, I'm a hundred, I think people understand this area, like understand that it is so crucial to all the senses, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's this, I've been yearning to have somebody that knows the science enough for me to, to say the following term. Oh, I was like, I'll connect oh, to you with the person the, who can yeah. explain oh. why the cerebellum is so deeply entrenched with every sensory. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, it's the cornerstone of the neuroscience yeah. in my book that I'm, that I'm going to be submitting in the cornerstone oh, to my trauma resolution model. The term I wanted to say is called, it's a fancy term, difficult term, but really important term. It's called developmental diaschisis, developmental diaschisis. And what this basically means is, is that the cerebellum is crucial for the early putting together of the sequencing of the sensory modalities, critical during development. Okay. uh, Developmental diaschisis is is like, so this is why uh, early intervention is so crucial. Because the cerebellum, if it gets derailed embryologically or in those first three critical period years, then there can be some huge downstream implications in terms of how the brain is putting together experience and it can set up a very fragmented way of sequencing reality. That's phenomenal that I've never heard it. I mean, that's what I've clinically seen, right? Yeah. yeah, clinically seen. And that's why I've seen, and that's why when I'm with families, if I can convince them to do anything, I'm like, go do sensory OT. Like, you're going to see. And many of my families don't come back with that ADHD diagnosis anymore. Like, wait, like, I say, go do that. If you're looking for a real non medication way that's going to help your kid, this, this is it. Beautifully said. I'm going to have to practice saying yeah. that, though. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not easy. I was like, I was like winding up for it. I'm like, Diaschisis, 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 diaschisis. Um, but it is incredible, incredibly astute research findings and, and just so important. And the implications are huge in terms of how trauma is processed. Because if yes. the cerebellum doesn't light up during trauma uh, reprocessing, uh-uh, 
it's not going to get resequences, resequenced and reconsolidated properly. So, you know, somatic experiencing and uh, sensory motor psychotherapy, EMDR, these are resequencing processes that have to light up the cerebellum to be effective. Same thing with early intervention strategies. That's so. fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Now I need to, yeah, I need to get your book. Good. When it's out. And I need to talk to you more about this. This is really fascinating. Yeah, cool. Well, I, it's cool to end on an excited note. I want to talk more. I got to get to a session, but just amazing to talk with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything that you want to p- uh, pitch to the audience? Um, I'm located in Southern in California, in Irvine, California. California. I do see patients virtually as well. So I'm an integrative psychiatrist who also does work with psychedelics. And I see children, adolescents, and adults. And be happy to see you in my practice if you're interested. Thank you so much, Layla, for being on the show. And I hope we get to talk again. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Boundless Body with The Somatic Doctor. Please leave a comment, subscribe, and like us on social media. We're a swarm. We're a colony. We're a multiplicity. Until next time, be well.